Miari kena usakasakabo, hola y buenos dia, hello and good day. It's Elba again, aka Phoenix Taino, playing some more wakfu. So this is a voiceover because some important family conversations were happening while I was playing the game. Uh, right now, I think I'm deciding what I want to do. Probably going to end up, yeah, I end up going into Temple of Scriptures. Looks like I have all of my characters added to my party so that whenever I pray at the ominous altar, all three characters end up getting the achievement. Don't remember what I did once I left here, to be honest. I guess we're gonna find out. Oh, that's right. I'm gonna complete this um, Life of a Hunter quest. I think it's Life of a Hunter 2, where I have to fight the, do the Royal Peewee dungeon, do the Skeleton dungeon, and the Treachney dungeon. And those places, those dungeons are in the mountain, in the cemetery, and in the forest, respectively. I think here I'm trying to decide, like, which one I want to do first. And I want to say I end up doing the PV dungeon first. I just opt to go in the order that they appear on the screen. That's me checking the Phoenix to make sure that if I, you know, get KO'd, I'm gonna end up back in Astrob and not on the Celestial Island of, Celestial Island of Rear somewhere else. So I took the Drago Turkey that takes you up to the mountains and literally right next to it is the Pee Wee Dungeon. Whenever I'm completing a quest, I almost always do it at dungeon level one. Just to easy peasy get it over with, get that, you know, task of the quest over and done with. Because I know I'm going to end up having to go back through all of the dungeons whether it's to level up or, you know, search for chests that I may have missed or, you know, you, you almost always end up going through a dungeon more than once. Um, especially if you end up playing with other, other people. So they may end up, you know, raising the dungeon level and then, you know, doing a group run just to see if, you know, if everybody can get like some of the best drops that that dungeon has to offer. So here we go, I'm gonna battle now. And because I'm on the Rubilac server, I can play as three characters. It is not for free. You can play the same as on the Ogress server in the Rubilac server. server. However, the market is different. And um, keep in mind, the majority of people on the Rubilac server are higher level. You're going to come across more lower level players in Ogress than on Rubilac. And um, also something to consider with Rubilac is that, yes, you can play with up to three different characters at the same time. And I want to say it's like $6 a month. You know, otherwise you can only play as one character at a time. So um, I am playing with, it looks like the characters that I have out are my mains. Um, my main, Watu Yanani. Then um, the first two alts that I ever created, which are um, Ebunaru and Katirahu. So Watu Yanani is a Sedita. Uh, Ebunaru is a Sram. And Katirahu is an Uganok.
Okay, now that that's over, I wanted to mention that the perk of playing on Rubolax and paying the $6 is that there's a lot of different tasks for different quests that you can't complete on your own. You need another player to help you get through it. So um, if you're the kind of person that wants to be able to play solo, quote unquote, you can play on Rubolax, pay, have, and, and basically be able to control the other players on the board versus on Ogress, that one, that server encourages more, um, you know, cooperative play, right? Where there are multiple players on the board, but you're not controlling all of them. Um, these are all playable characters that other people are controlling. So um, it can add another layer of fun, you know? Um, and can be a way for folks to socialize who may or may not struggle with socializing in more face-to-face -face environments, if if that makes sense. But, um, oh, another thing that I remembered while I was watching, uh, going back through this, is, um, A, there's a chest over here and I need Mimi Kibble. I checked back multiple times just to see if, like, Oh, maybe I have some Mimi Kibble on me now instead of opening my inventory every time and just checking and doing that. Um, I don't know why I realized afterwards that I could have just done that and it would have been easier. Um, but uh, there's that chest and eventually I realized that with my SRAM, I can do a certain move that if I do it on my ally, it doesn't, it doesn't attack them, it doesn't harm them. But I am still able to like move have more like range of movement on the board which is really freaking cool so yeah i'm gonna be quiet now Something I've been meaning to point out is that the character that's moving now is the SRAM, the one with a skull on her head. She can summon a double of herself, which allows more movement points. Um, and A puts another player on the board. Um, her double is limited in um, range and, and the kind of attacks and whatnot that she can do. But um, she comes with the default costume, which is the headdress. And all the other characters I either have without the headdress or with something else on their head. So I can keep track of who's who and the kind of moves and all that stuff. The character moving now is the Uganok. And the Uganok can summon, summon this little, like, this little bow wow, this little puppy. Little puppy dog. Um, and uh, that puppy dog, though, can do some damage. That puppy dog can do some of the same moves that the Uganok can do, which is pretty cool. And then the last character on the board is my main, the Sedita. And the Sedita is um, a healer and a summoner. So she can, what, what she does is she summons dolls and each doll has a specific, um, you know, uh, I guess, attack or ability, right? So the main doll 
that I summon is usually the attack doll, and then I have enough action points to go ahead and summon the healing doll as well. Um, the attack doll, doll, um, attack dog, attack doll looks like it has um, antlers, and then the healing doll looks like it has a flower um, on its head, which is really cute, um, and it's pink. The attack doll is green, but. Um, Eventually, you can summon, once you have at least one doll, right, you can summon the ultra powerful, which is a doll that has more action points, more movement points or whatever than the quote unquote basic, like standard dolls. And the ultra powerful has all of the abilities of every doll that was on the floor when it was summoned. Summoning it will sacrifice those dolls, but then you can resummon them and have the ultra powerful with all their moves and one of each of the other um, standard dolls because you can only have one type on the board at a time. So usually I will go ahead and at least have the attack doll on the board before I summon the ultra powerful. Um, the only issue I come across with the Sadita, I wish that like you could change the order of your spells on your summons the same way you can on your playable character um because that would be nice because when i summon the ultra powerful and only the attack doll was on the board the attack is shortcut one like the the number buttons and you can press alt and then a number button or whatever for the second like tier of spells and uh, controller shift or however you set it right you just go into your options to uh, set your shortcuts how you um, how would how it would be easier for you to remember or whatever but once you have your shortcut set like usually one is the attack for um, the ultra powerful but if the healer was also on the board whenever the ultra powerful is summoned then the one button actually is the healing spell and the attack button is two. So I have, on more than one occasion, accidentally healed an enemy instead of attacked it with the ultra powerful, depending on what dolls were already on the board when, on the board when I summoned when I summoned it. So yeah, fun times. Um, I'm gonna stop rambling now, but this battle should be over relatively quickly. All right, y'all about to see this puppy dog in action. All right, so you may or may not be able to see on the screen that the three spells on top are the same ones that the Ubinok has, right? It's a water spell, an earth spell, and an air spell that basically poisons, right? So this Peewee just got bit, is about to walk off like he, like he did some shit, and is just gonna keel over and die because that's how poison works. See, boom, done. Done, he's gone, he's dead. And now you're about to see what I was talking about with the Sedita, but if not, I'm going to describe it. So basically that sound you just heard is me summoning the ultra powerful. And what that does is sacrifice the dolls on the board as mentioned earlier. And now I can, I can summon those dolls again. So I have two attackers on the board instead of just the one. The ultra powerful can attack and can heal because the healer was on the board as well when it was summoned. And um, so in the next move, I'll probably summon that healer. And that will put three players that might be that can control on the board. Plus, 
each of the other players that I have, the um, SRAM and the uh, Uganok, and their summons, because they each have a summon on the board as well. So this is a really cool way to kind of, you know, tip the scales ever in my favor. Here I almost run out of time because I'm trying to figure out what moves I can do that will do the most damage to this peewee in front of me without harming my ally. I don't remember what I was doing or talking about at this point, so I'm just going to fast forward to when this battle actually starts. Uganox intro is so extra. I love it.
You know what I honestly didn't realize until now? That this little pink peewee, whenever she heals, she does like a little ballet twirl, a cute little, a cute little spin for us. That's absolutely adorable. I'm not even gonna lie. Like they make these these quote unquote monsters so cute, you almost don't want to fight them if they weren't like killing your characters. You know what I mean? Now what I'm about to do is summon a tree because A, if I have something behind me, I can't be attacked from behind, which does the most damage to my character. And B, the area around the tree, each square immediately around the tree um, provides bonuses. I want to say it's like an additional 10 health points every turn or something like that. Um, or perhaps it's armor. I can't remember exactly what it is, but it's beneficial to stand in that area. Um, the main character, any allies. Unfortunately, it would help any enemies who stand in that area as well, which is why I generally don't just keep trees up when I do. Um, when I do summon them before I move away, I try to, if I can, uh, take it down so that no enemies go to stand there and now they have like extra healing or whatever. You know what I'm saying? Allies only.
Finished the Pee Wee Dungeon, so now it looks like, I don't remember exactly where I go. I want to say I go straight to the cemetery, but I don't know if I make any pit stops between there. Between here and there, because, you know, your girl gets easily distracted, so. Nope, I'm going straight to the cemetery. entrance is literally right next to the Drago turkey and it looks like I'm just see easily distracted I'm probably gonna end up putting items in my inventory to make space for any drops I get from this dungeon before going in but let's see what I what I actually do let's see how well I know myself Okay, so it looks like I was deciding whether or not I wanted to go in my Haven bag or not. And I decided, probably because I had enough space in my inventory, like, you know what, screw it, I'll just go ahead and start the dungeon. Stasis 1, and uh, collect all the seeds and whatnot, the essence of Skeleton, <laughs> and then I'll start the battle. Another thing I wanted to point out is that it may seem like I'm doing something pointless when it comes to my healing doll 
and basically having it give smooches to myself and allies despite the fact that we have full health. But in the gamer log, you'll you'll notice that even though I don't get more HP with the healing move, I do get what's called swelling, which regardless gives me 15% more damage. So it's worth it, even if I don't need it, to just go ahead and increase increase my character and any allies' uh, uh, percentage of damage. Why not? So it's officially at this point that I realized that my SRAM can jump behind any character on the board. You know what I mean? If it's an enemy, she will also inflict damage. If it's an ally, then she just jumps behind them and can uh, use her movement points from that point forward. So, you know, at this point, I'm like, I'm basically, you know, doing an evil finger you know what's the what's the word like movement or whatever i don't know just like <laughs> i'm about to be i'm about to be insufferable with this knowledge and ability <laughs> all right so here we go
Oh, see, now that freaking gobble has the skeleton above his head. And that means that in like three turns, if he attacks any of my characters, they're done. K.O. You know, fin, finito, the end. It will take out, even if they're at full health, they die immediately. So that's fun.
At this point, I'm pretty sure I go to the forest and do the Trichini dungeon. But I want to say I come back and do this dungeon a second time. Because I got to get, I got to fight each of the bosses at least once. And then I believe I do the cemetery dungeon a second time to try and get another more force horn or something like that. I end up needing something else. And instead of buying it, I try I try the dungeon a second time and and then I and then I think I just give up and go ahead and purchase it. Purchase the item from the market because because why not? Because I can. That's why. So yeah. In just a minute, I'm going to fast forward because I basically am going through my inventory and rearranging things and whatnot. So yeah, I'm going to fast forward and then pick up when I actually start the Krishni dungeon. Boy, let me tell you something. This dungeon was difficult as all get out to figure out when I first started playing. And if it wasn't for the fact that when I was looking for it, eventually somebody came out from, from that entrance, I would never have found it. So this would be the right way to get down here. You click on the appropriate things and you can get down here and then enter the dungeon and boom. So here we go.
So in the Tree Chnee Dungeon, the strategy is basically take out the biggest tree here, because that one summons other characters. Then the medium-sized one will heal, so that's the next one you want to take out. The red spider looking one, and then the little, the little nut characters would be the least worrisome, but you definitely don't want to get outnumbered by them because they can do some damage. They can do some damage.
We finally made it to the boss battle. After this, I believe I go turn in items to Automize Disciple, realize that I don't have enough for, for all of the tasks, for all of the characters. So I end up going back to the cemetery dungeon, doing a run through of that one more time, and then turning in everything necessary.
The cool thing about any enemies that summon is that if you take them out, usually everything they summoned goes with them.
After finally defeating the tree snail, I do end up going back to the cemetery, doing a quick run through of that one again. I don't get enough of all the resources that I need, so I just go to the market, buy everything else that I need that I didn't already get from all the drops at that point, and then go back to, to Automize Disciple. So we're just going to fast forward through all of that and get to, to that part. Here we're at Astro Field. We get to Automize Disciple, confirm that my two alts have all three resources needed. Go ahead and confirm that we have them to Automize Disciple, turn them in, and the quest is done for all three of my characters, my main and the two alts. Yay, we did it. I'm just going to check real quick to confirm that I got the two coats that it says I should have. And then that's all, folks. See y'all in the next one.